Come on, give our drama team a hand. Give them a hand. Give Jesus a hand for being the King of Kings. Give Jesus a hand for being the Lord of Lords. Give Jesus a hand for being the God above all gods. Everybody stay standing. Let's just lift your hands up right now. This is a day. This is the day. We look in the face of our Jesus and we say thank you. Every day we should be saying thank you for the cross. Where would you be without the cross? Where would you be without what Jesus has done? Every hand lifted, every eye closed. I want you to thank him for the cross right now. Thank him for the cross. Take some minutes, just one minute right now and just thank him. Thank him for the cross. What has the cross done for you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why are you here today? Your sins are cleansed. If this is your first time, welcome to the way. Over if you're in the South Hall, if you're in the North Hall, if you're here in the sanctuary, we welcome you as a part of the family. Thank you for coming today. Give everyone a hand right now. But come on, real quick, let's just lift our hands one more time and just thank him. Turn that piano up. The blood of Jesus. Come on, everybody sing. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the Come on, tell it to him, not me. What can make me whole? And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of... One more time, what can wash away my sins? Come on, I want to hear you to the back. And what can wash up? Yes, sing it out. Nothing but the blood of... South Hall, North Hall, come on, don't keep your nights closed. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of... Come on, let's say nothing but the blood one more time. Oh, it's nothing but the blood of... One more time, come on, just one more time. What is it? It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Give him a hand. Come on. Give him a hand. God is good. He's awesome. Because of the blood. Because of the blood. You all can be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremiah. Galatians 2.20. I have a message for you today. Lean in. Listen in. This is the greatest day ever. The day that Jesus came for your sin and for mine. Wherever you've come into this building from today, whatever your past has been, whether you regularly go to church or not, whether you find yourself a part of a family and that, that's rejected you or a family that loves you. We will be here to love you. The church is a safe place. The church is a hospital for sickness. You are welcome in this place. Come on, tell somebody around you. Just say, you're welcome here. Tell the person on your left and right, you're welcome here. Welcome to the house today. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's a movie, there's a show and movies called The Walking Dead. It's a very famous show. It's out in the world. The concept of the show and why it became so popular is because it's a post-apocalyptic environment. Tragedy has already happened and there's few survivors left. And there are people 
that have gotten this disease. And for them, they might have died at one point, but they kind of come back to life. And we call them zombies. It's huge right now in our culture. But the point is, they're not totally dead, but they're not totally alive. They're kind of walking around and... They don't really have the same capabilities as normal people. They don't really have the same. They're not really in tune in their brains. But, but they're kind of being driven by something other than themselves. In that case, is this disease. But what's so powerful about this is God says that when he came down and died on the cross, not only was he crucified, but your old life was crucified with him. It wasn't just Jesus on that cross. You were on that cross. Which one of you? What do you mean? I'm sitting in this building, Gavin. No, understand. The depressed you is on that cross. The, the lonely you is on that cross. The one who was, uh, the one who went to jail and had a life term, but God set you free, even though you had a life term in prison, but you got out after six years, 18 years. That one who was guilty. The one who has sinned, the one who yells and screams at his wife, the angry rage for you, the one that you can't help, that was crucified with Jesus on that cross. It wasn't just him hanging there, but it was your old self that you don't like talking about. It was that past you that you don't want. Jesus says that it's no longer you who is living because that old self has now been crucified. There's something about walking dead people that God loves. You see, Jesus doesn't actually trust the living. He trusts the dead. He trusts people who are living but have crucified their old desires, have died to their own dreams, have died to their own wants, have died to their own ambitions, He's not interested in making disciples of people who want to build their own kingdom. He wants disciples who will follow him and build the kingdom of God, rescuing souls, helping orphans, helping widows, saving the lost. But there's something about death. God doesn't just trust you. He trusts walking dead people. There's something about you that's alive but has been buried in Christ and now it's no longer you, but Jesus is standing up inside of you. Jesus is speaking through you. Jesus is in your hands. Jesus is in your feet. Jesus is who's talking to your neighbor. Jesus is who's doing it. It's got to be you've yielded your body. You see, disciples are people who yield their body. My hands aren't mine anymore, God. My feet aren't mine anymore, God. My mind isn't mine anymore, Lord. I'm going to need help with my thoughts, Lord. Don't you know it? How many of y'all had a really messed up brain, but when God got a hold of you, he renewed your mind through his word. Now you think differently. You see, those old thoughts have to die. Those old ways you used to make decisions. You see, you used to reason in a certain way. When, when something would go on, you'd automatically go to self. You'd say, I can handle this. I, I, I can do this. I just got to find the solution. And you would stress out. You would pressure, but when Jesus came into your life, he said, I am El Shaddai. I'm a provider. I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm Jehovah. I'm all of these things that you need. You're still going to work, but you're going to lean on me. There's no pressure anymore for it. Don't be anxious in anything, but in all things through prayer and supplication, offer your request to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. There's something about you alive, but... There's parts of you that are dead. You see, there are many gospels that are being preached today. Galatians 1, 6, Paul is talking to the church and he says this. Look at this scripture. I'm astonished, he says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel. There's many gospels. Today, there's not just one gospel. There's a gospel of grace without repentance. You know, I can just do what I want to do, and I can just be who I want to be, and I'll just make the decisions I will, and God knows my heart, so it's okay. There's a gospel of faith without works. You just say it all the time, but you don't act like you believe anything. You say you believe in Jesus, but you can't even talk to your neighbor. You say you believe in God. There's this gospel of faith without works. It's in the church. 
There's a gospel of truth without Jesus. Literally, it's your truth, or it's your truth, or it's your truth, or it's my truth, or it's their truth. But there is truth, and truth has a name. His name is Jesus. But we found a way to have a gospel of truth without Jesus. We meet in churches without Jesus. We have worship services without Jesus. We preach sermons without Jesus. Can you imagine your birthday party? Just think about it. They, it's a surprise. You come home one day. You come home to your birthday. There's all these people in your lawn. You're like, oh, no, no way. They're about to surprise me. I didn't even think anybody remembered my birthday. And you walk up to your own house, and there's this bodyguard who's in front of the door. You know, all the guests got to go through this checklist. And you come up and say, uh, what's going on? He said, who are you? You go, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the birthday boy. Or I'm the birthday girl. This is my house. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, let me see if you're on the list. The list? Can I get in my front door, please? Uh, this is my house. Don't you see? They're, they're singing songs about me in my house. They're, they're doing happy birthdays about me in my house. Don't, don't you know this is all for me? And he says, um, I'm sorry, you're not on the invitation list. That's what it's like when Jesus goes to churches all over America. They're singing songs about him. They're trying to speak about him. But because they all have their own truth and haven't made way and died to their own opinions, died to their own things. You see, this isn't a gospel where you can share truth. Truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. There's a gospel of love without sacrifice that's there right now. I love you, but I won't give you a coat to make you warm. I'll preach to you all day, but I won't give you a cup of cold water when you're thirsty. There's a gospel of power without death. And let me tell you something. There is no power in the Christian life. There is no power with Jesus without the death of Jesus on the cross. Your life has to be put up because through your death, power is born. You see, you got to die to I, I, it's all about me. Listen to the words of the devil, Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. This is God speaking. He said, the devil said in his heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will be enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I, 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 when you are having a life that is full of I, you look like the devil. You're not able to help anyone else. Your life is full of I. How can it be for him if it's full of I? This is a gospel of death to the I. It makes way for Jesus. The cross is practical. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, the cross is practical. You see, this is what Jesus says, Luke 9, 23 through 26. This is how practical it is. Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves Take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. You see, not only did Jesus die on the cross, but when Jesus says, come and follow me, you go into his presence, your sins are forgiven, you have a chance to be healed of your sicknesses and diseases, and you look up at that cross as the most beautiful thing. But before you turn and leave, Jesus taps you on the shoulder, and he says, you forgot something, and now you take your cross. You walk every day with your cross, because death and the cross are practical for your life. You see, the cross equals suffering. The cross equals death. But see, what is the cross practically? Let me just tell you, every single one of you are going to have a chance to take up your cross even before you leave this building. This is what you're going to do. You're going to find that there's a moment you're going to leave. You're going to get out into the parking lot, and it's going to be packed, let me just tell you. And you're going to have an opportunity for your will and God's will will cross. And your attitude can be either you choose your own will or you can be happy for the souls that got to hear the word of God tonight. You can be happy that even if you might have to go to sleep late tonight, it wasn't about us. It was about Jesus. It was about people knowing the love of God. Your will and God's will every day will have an opportunity to cross. And the point at which they cross is the moment you get to take up your cross by submitting to God's will. 
Jesus says, come and follow me. But when he says, come and follow me, he says, I got something for you. And he gives you a cross. I'm not talking about a cross necklace. Nothing wrong with wearing a cross necklace. I'm talking about not something you can wear on your neck, not something that you can even see. It's something that has gone so deep down inside. The cross is applied to you as a father. The cross is applied to your marriage. The cross is applied to your finances. The cross is applied to everything you do. The cross goes deep. It's a practical tool. The word disciple means one who follows closely and listens. It also means one who learns to think, talk, and act just like the teacher. If you want to be like Jesus, and who wants to be like Jesus, put your hands up. I want to be like Jesus. Come on, say, I want to be like Jesus. Say, I want to be like Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, please understand this. There's going to have to be some dying. You see, God does not actually partner with you per se. Listen closely. God only partners with the parts of you that have been surrendered to Jesus for his control. God doesn't actually just partner with you. He partners with the parts of you that have been surrendered to Jesus for control. You see, the reason why God doesn't give up on you, ever wondered, you know, God, you're just so good to me. Who has God been patient with in this place right here? Who has God been patient with and showed mercy? He's shown me mercy. Have you ever wondered, why is God so patient with me? Why does he just never give up on me? Why is God always there when I call out? Do you know that you could not serve him for 50 years, call out his name, and he'll be there for you? Do you know that you can turn your back on him? Do you know that you can go to the worst places, do the worst things? You know you could cuss him out and he'll still be there to love you? Do you know that you can blaspheme and still be there to love you? You know that you can try to do whatever you can to push him away, to try to get out. But God's going to be there waiting for you with his mercy and his love. That's why you can't count out your family members. I know you think they're crazy, but God sees them as a child that he loves. I know you don't think there's hope for them, but God sees. I don't know where you came from, but I know that God drew you to this place. You might have been like, you know, I just came to church tonight because my daughter comes. I just wanted to make her happy. I'm coming to church once a year. No, 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 no. The Lord was drawing you to this place because you're sitting in this chair, because he loves you. He never gives up on you. Why does God never give up on us? Listen, because he never gives up on himself in you. If you are saved and have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and for many of you, you don't yet. But tonight, you're going to get an opportunity to receive the way, the truth, and the life in just a few moments. But if you are a Christian, you say, I've messed up so much. I've done so much. Why does he never give up? Because as long as the Holy Spirit is still inside of you, you are not actually defeatable. As long as the Holy Ghost is still inside of you, you're not actually defeatable. You might be deceived thinking you're beaten. Somebody might tell you you're beaten, but you're never actually beaten when the Holy Ghost is inside of you. You're one surrendered choice away from a breakthrough. <laughs> you see, you are one surrendered choice away from every breakthrough in your life. God doesn't give up on you because he didn't give up on himself inside of you. My God. Romans 8, 35 through 37, Paul's talking. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Come on, say it. Can anything separate you from God's love? Come on, say it. Can anything separate you from God's love? Paul seems to think the same thing. He says, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble? If we have calamity? If we're persecuted? If we're hungry? If we're destitute, if we're in danger, if we're threatened with death, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. You see, what happened? How can a man say, it doesn't bother me when they talk about me? How can this man say, they're persecuting me, but it, I don't care anymore? How can he say, you can gossip about me? It doesn't affect me anymore. I'm still a victor. Even though you say I'm not, I still am in Jesus Christ. Even though you think I'm crazy, Jesus knows my name. What is happening with this man? Well, let me tell you. You ever been to a funeral? Who's been to a funeral before? Do you know when you go by the casket? <laughs> you walk by the casket. There's a viewing. You look at the body. Now, if you wanted to, you could take your friend, 
your other friend, and you could have a big gossip session about the woman in the casket. She's not going to get up out of the casket and care what you're saying. You could go ahead and steal $50,000 out of her bank account. She's not going to care what you stole from her. Why? Because she's... You see, Paul says there's a place you can get to. You could persecute me. You could talk about me. But I've already died. Jesus is, my image doesn't matter to me. It's the image of Jesus. There's something that's died on the inside. I am the walking dead. There is a power you can't steal from me if I'm already dead. Listen, you can't steal from somebody who gives away everything freely. This is how, listen, you can take the control away from anybody. You don't have to have them offend you. They don't have to bother you. Why? Because if they steal from you, the Bible says, go ahead and pray for them and give them a gift. Why does Jesus say to buy a gift from someone who steals from you? Because you release their power over you. Because what happens is they could steal from you, but they don't steal from you because you sow it as a seed. Actually, you didn't steal from me. I gave it to you as a seed. Be blessed. <laughs> I'm talking about a different kind of Christianity. I'm talking about Jesus' life. I'm talking about disciples. Abraham came to God. His name was Abram. And God had a plan for him. He says, listen, I got a different future than what you're living right now. You're going to be the father of many nations. But he says, I got to change something first. I have to change your name. There's an identity shift that's going to happen with many of you tonight. You see, you are one person right now. But once Jesus calls your name, he's calling you to follow him. And once you begin to follow him, you're no longer Allegra the depressed. You're no longer Cassie the, the bitter. You're no longer, uh, you know, Jody the messed up and addicted. You're going to be freed in Jesus Christ. There's a name change. There's a shift in identity. You used to identify with addiction, but some of y'all are going to have your addiction broken tonight at this altar. You used to identify with death. You've been plagued. Those voices have been speaking to you to kill yourself. I've been saying it's time to end it. Those voices are going to be removed from your ears. God loves you. He sees you. Let me look at somebody next to you. I want you to say this. This is powerful. You don't know how powerful this is. Look at the person on your left and say, you will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Say it. Okay, look at the person on your right. You will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Say it. You're going to live for Jesus. You're going to live for God. It's not over. You're in this building. Jesus is calling you tonight. You see, the devil tried to get Jesus to pass up the cross three times. First, it was in the desert. Remember, if you can make these, low, these rocks into bread, if you'll just bow down before me, Jesus, I'll give you all of these kingdoms. You don't have to go to the cross. Why would you have to go to the cross? Just bow down right here and you can have it. Get away from me, Satan, for the word of God says. Then the second time, because Satan couldn't do it, to him personally, Satan had to use a close friend. You see, if the devil can't get you to do it himself, he'll send someone who loves you to have a false belief. Here's Listen, the most dangerous person in the world is not a sinner. The most dangerous person in the world is a good person with bad beliefs. So he sends Peter, and he's saying, I'm going to go to the cross. And Peter comes, and don't you know it's Satan behind him because Jesus rebukes Satan. And he says, come along to the side, Jesus. You don't have to go to the cross. This is not going to happen to you. Are you kidding me? You don't deserve this. Get behind me, Satan. And the third time that he tried to get him to pass up the cross was on the cross. Do you remember? He's on the cross in the book of John. And the Bible says that the soldiers are there before he gave his last breath. And they said, if you really are the son, the Pharisee said, come off that cross. Prove it right now. Three different times to pass up the cross. Why? Why did the devil want him to pass up the cross? Why does the devil want you to pass up the cross? Because your death is the destruction of Satan's plan in your life. Your death is a destruction of Satan's plan over your children. Your death is a destruction of Satan's plan over your marriage. 
You know that the devil can't destroy a marriage where there's two humbled people who have been touched by God. But the devil can destroy marriages all over the world who are egotistical, who are full of pride, who want to be right, who want to prove themselves right. But if you get two people who have been touched by God and will humble themselves, nothing is impossible for that marriage. John 12, 24 says this, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. You see, please look at me up here. The greatest things that are going to come out of your life and your legacy are not going to come from the moments and the things that you just tried your hardest to make happen. They're going to come from the moments you died to your own self and surrendered to God. The greatest history and legacy you will have will come out of your death. It won't come out of your life. When you die in this place, your own will, it's a gospel of death. Today was a day Jesus died. Today was a day he conquered all. And he did it in you. But he says you got to take the cross. You got to know I'm your Lord now. You got to know I got your back. I'll be with you at all times. But you got to listen to my voice. You got to become a disciple. Wherever you've come from today, if this is the first time you've been at the way, if this is the time you're coming this week, and I want you to know God saw you when you got in your car, when you drove here to the building, when you waited in the line, when you got into the building, if you're in the South Hall, if you're in the North Hall, he's saying, follow me. He can give you a life you've never dreamed. But he's going to hand you a cross tonight. You see, there's an olive, and the olive has what they call the flesh of the olive. But the flesh of the olive, even though it's tasty, it's not what heals wounds. The flesh of the olive is not what anoints people for service. The flesh of the olive is not what can fuel a fire so the fire never goes out. It's the oil inside of the olive. And the oil that's inside of the olive must be crushed in order for what is really inside of you to come out. You see, the Holy Ghost is inside of you. Don't forget that today there was a man whose flesh had to be broken. So the most precious thing, the blood of Jesus, could come out for you and me. This was a day, that earth shell, this shell of a body had to be broken. The nails were driven in the hands. The nails were driven in the feet. His side was pierced. Why? Because when they pierced his heart, they pierced his side and said blood and water flowed out. Why is that? Because his heart literally burst inside of his chest. The heart of Jesus exploded inside of his chest. Why? So that your heart today could be mended and healed. You see, if the blood and water didn't flow out, the church couldn't be found in Christ. There had to be an opening in the body of Jesus. There had to be blood and water flowed out. The vessel and the flesh had to break so that what was beautiful on the inside, we could all go find it out and now not be outside of Christ, not know him from a distance, but we could be found in Christ. You see, he says, you got to take this cross. You got to take this cross. Every person, listen. There are two voices that will always happen in your life. Two voices always speaking. One is the voice of the flesh. It loves comfort. It loves security. It loves the things that you know. It loves things that you can control. And it's always going to keep you in a place of comfort so you never actually accomplish anything in your life. 
It's going to draw you away from sacrifice. It hates inconvenience. Jesus was never inconvenienced by anybody. They were pulling on him all day long, but he wasn't inconvenienced by him. They were trying to touch him thousands at one time, but he never looked at him and said, get away from me. I don't got time for you. Then there's a second voice, and it's the voice of the Spirit. I like to think of it as the voice of the cross calling out for you and me. This voice is a voice that loves discomfort. This voice is a voice that's not afraid of doing things they're not used to. This voice is a voice that says, God, work in me. Make your cross alive in me. This is the cross. To you and me today, God gives us this. And I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come up and receive the benefits of the cross. But please understand, we have to apply the cross to every area of our life. If you're a Christian, have you applied the cross to your marriage? Have you applied the cross to your own ideas and your own schedule? Have you applied the cross to your schedule and your plans and said, Lord, not my plans, your plans. Lord, not my will, your will. Have you applied the cross to your marriage and said, God, I've tried everything I can. But Lord, if you don't help me, give me that cross. Give me that cross, Jesus. If you'll allow Jesus to move in you. The Bible says that this treasure is found in earthen vessels. There's a treasure inside of you. And Paul says that we daily take the death of Jesus and we carry it with us. We carry the death of Jesus with us everywhere we go. We carry that cross. And in our bodies as we carry that death, the life of Jesus is able to be shown. Why? Because you get out of the way. Your own words get out of the way. All of a sudden you have wisdom you've never known you can have. All of a sudden, you can actually help your sister who's going crazy. All of a sudden, you can actually help your brother and help him with what he's going through in his life. All of a sudden, your marriage is beginning to get healed. All of a sudden, you wake up and you don't want to die, but you want to live. All of a sudden, the cross. Today is the day Jesus took it all for you and me. He was willing to go to the cross with joy. How could he have joy? How could Jesus have joy to be nailed to a cross? It was the worst punishment there was. He had joy because the Bible said he saw you and me. There was a joy that was set before him. If you're online, I'm looking at you right now. Wherever you're sitting on your couch, if you're in the South Hall, in the North Hall, if you're in this building, Jesus saw your face when he went to the cross. And even though he was going to take the worst punishment, he said, it's all worth it. Why? Because you're worth it. You're worth it. You over there in the back, you're worth it to Jesus. You over there in the back, you're worth it to Jesus. You right here, you're worth it. The cross. I got great news for you. Are you ready? This is the best part. The Bible says this. Last scripture. This is so good. Sin is no longer your master because when you died with Christ, you were set free from sin and death. And Romans 6 says, hallelujah, and Romans 6 says that every single sin you've ever committed, everything you're ashamed of, was crucified to that cross. Sin has no right to tell you what to do. I want to tell you in the back, sin has no right to tell you what to do because sin is not your master. We now live not under the power of the law, but under the grace and power of Jesus Christ, the freedom of Jesus. So here's my question. Take that back. For everybody in here, there are crosses all over this building. There's one right here. There's one right here. There's one in the back. There's one in the back. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. There's a pen that's in front of you on your seat. If you're in the overflow, try to find something to write with. If you have a pen or a paper, something. But there's a pen. And you would have been given a paper when you came into this building. This is what I want you to know. 
your sin and your past are dead. But here's the problem. Some of you will not let it go. You see, if God's not able to heal your past, he can't give you your future. If the cross of Jesus isn't able to heal you of your past, he can't give you your future. But let me tell you, God's arms couldn't get any more wide waiting for you today. You see, the arms of Jesus can't get any more wide waiting for you today. It's as wide as it gets. He says, come on, carry your sins to me. Carry your burdens to me. Carry what you're ashamed of. Tonight is the night. As these crosses are all over these places, I want you to write down right now what you are leaving behind tonight. Why? Because Romans 6 says this, since you have been dead to sin, you must now consider yourselves as well dead to those sins. You see, you're going to have to step out in faith tonight and say, you know what? I came in with addiction, but through the cross in this moment, as I write this down, as I'm going to bring this up, you're going to nail these papers to these crosses all over the building. You're going to come up quickly, and you're going to get attacked, and you're going to nail it in. And then you're going to go back to your seat. Let me tell you what's going to happen. As you write this down, as you come in and put it on the cross, you're going to feel something release. Release. Listen, you don't have to tell the person next to you what you're writing down. You don't have to tell the person on your right or your left. Jesus sees. Jesus knows. But it's time to let it go. It's time to move on. It's time to let go of that adultery. It's in your past. I know you did it. But Jesus wants you to move on. He wants to give you a cross to give you life. It's time to move forward. I know that you used to cuss them out. I know that you were a horrible husband or wife, but Jesus is calling you tonight. My daughter, my son, let it go. Let it go. I know you don't believe in yourself, but remember, God never gives up on you. If you give up on yourself, he will not join you. If you give up on yourself, he will not join you. He never gives up on you. Because he knows the power that he has to change you. And it could happen right now. Write down something right now. Every person writing something down across this place. Helpers, if you could come close to these crosses, please. Helpers, come close. In the back, come close. Get in your position. Right now, when you're ready, turn up that music. And just I want you to begin walking up real quick. Begin to put this on the cross. You're going to push in that tack and twist. And then you're going to go back to your seat. This is a solemn moment. We don't have to clap. We don't have to shout. This is between you and God, every person. Find a cross closest to you in the back, both sides. In the front, go through. Right now, right now. You can fold it up if you don't want anybody to see it. Jesus knows. Jesus sees. In the back, I see people with the cross. In the left, I see people with the cross. Up here in the front, look at these people. This is a solemn moment with God. Move around. Let them go past. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. This is a moment between you and the Lord. The Holy Spirit is here right now. He's watching every single one of you. The past is broken. When Jesus died, he crucified your old life. He crucified that old man. He crucified the things that you do not like about yourself. But it's time to apply the cross to your life. It's time to let his forgiveness touch you. It's time to let his goodness touch you. It's time to let that blood that his body had to break to open and re-give. It's time to receive it all over you tonight, the blood of Jesus. Right now, as you're coming, you're repenting to God. Everybody who has these papers in your hand, I'm going to ask you a question. As you continue to come and put these on the cross, listen. I wish I could lay hands on every single one of you and agree with you. What you're doing is so powerful. This isn't a rush. you got to make sure that you have the time and you do this. But I want to ask you a question with every person here. Listen to me. Do you know without a shadow of a doubt 
You see these people all over this building. They're making a stand. They say, Jesus, I'm receiving your forgiveness today. Have you received his forgiveness? They're making a stand to say, Lord, I'm letting the past go. Have you allowed your past to be healed by Jesus by receiving his sacrifice? Listen, y'all, there's nowhere to go. The parking lots will be full. Let me tell you, you might as well enjoy Jesus in this room right now and give your life to him fully. If you say, you know what, Gavin, you know what, Gavin, I don't know if I know Jesus. I don't know if I've made Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Listen, I want you right now boldly. What's going to happen is this. There are already people coming up to the altar doing this, but I want you to stand up right where you're at. And if you're already standing, I need you to raise your hand right now. Nobody else lifting their hands. I see you. I see you. I see you. Keep them high. Keep them high right now. Keep them high. Keep them high. I see you. Who wants to receive Jesus and have peace with God? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. I see your hand. Lift it unashamed. Don't put it down. Don't put it out. Keep it up. Give him a hand right now. Give a hand to all these people making a choice for Jesus. Come on, give a hand for all these people making a choice for Jesus. In the overflow, put your hands up right now. I want to receive Jesus. With your hands lifted, I'm going to pray for you right now. Every person, hands lifted. And we're going to continue in this moment, but I'm going to continue to walk through what's about to happen next in your life. Hands lifted. Everybody right now, I want you to say this prayer with me. Every person, these are people who are giving their lives to Jesus. If you're giving it to the for the first time, or if you're rededicating your life to the Lord. Listen, if your hands are up and everybody join, say, Dear Lord Jesus. Come on, dear Lord Jesus. I give you my life. I repent of all my sins. I thank you that you've washed me with your blood. I receive the forgiveness of the cross. Wash me clean. I hand over my life. To you this is no longer my life I want you to be seen in me I want you to be seen through me Lord God take over my life right now in Jesus name now every person right now if your hands are lifted this is what's gonna happen I want to pray a prayer for you right now that God will help you to forgive yourself close your eyes right now every person who just received Jesus and if you were not one of those people, but you need this prayer, you should lift your hands up too. You need to let go. You see, when God forgives us, it's hard enough. But to forgive ourselves is a whole nother thing because you don't believe you deserve it. Well, guess what? You're right. You don't deserve it. But Jesus didn't give you what you deserve. Jesus did not give you what you deserve. Jesus paid a price that you could never pay so you can get what he deserves. Let me say it again. You do not get what you deserve. Jesus paid the price that you couldn't pay so you can get what he deserves. Hands are lifted right now. I want you to just ask God to help you, and I want you to let it go. Every eye closed right now. If you're up right now, continue to move. But if you're sitting in your seats, I want you to close your eyes. If you're up right now, continue to move but I want you to ask the Lord to help you right now. There's a move of God happening. I feel it right here on the right side. I see people right over here on the left. God is touching you. Ask him, Lord, help me forgive myself. Let him detach you from that sin. Let him detach you from that addiction. Let him detach you right now. I declare freedom for you in Jesus' name. I declare freedom and detachment from all things that are hindering you in Jesus' name. That in this moment, you let yourself go from your past. That all over this building, if you're under the sound of my voice, that Jesus is speaking to you personally right now. Holy Spirit, just move. Holy Spirit, just move on them right now. As they're walking up, putting their sins on the cross. God, as they're all the way in the back, as they're in the overflow, I pray, God, you meet them right where they're at right now. Just talk to Jesus. Don't talk to anybody on your left or your right. Just take this moment to be with God. He's here for you. Jesus is here for you. There's so many people right now that Jesus is touching, that he's reaching out to you with his love. Listen, in this room and in this church, we're just being honest with God right now, and we're giving it all to him. 
wherever you are, if you're in the overflow or if you're at home sitting on your couch or if you're in your car listening right now, give it to Jesus. Start brand new. Let it go in Jesus' name. Every person who's listening right now, can we give a hand for everybody who just received Jesus? Come on, let's give a hand for everybody who just received Jesus. As they are continuing right now, I want to turn the lights up for one moment because I want to just say one last thing to every single one of you right now. If you have received Jesus, if you have received him as your master, if you say tonight is that night, I want to tell you what we're going to do for you. We want you to get baptized. We're going to have a massive baptism this next Sunday. We're going to have a massive baptism. It's going to come right away. This Sunday's Easter. The Sunday right after, massive baptism. When that happens, we want you to come. We're going to give you a shirt, and we're going to put you in water. This is so important that you make a public declaration to everyone, to everyone that you are no longer ashamed of your faith. But in front of all, your old life is truly dead. You've been crucified with Jesus on that cross. We're going to put you in water. We're going to pull you up, and you're going to be brand new. Maybe you were baptized when you were a little boy or a little girl. Listen, maybe you didn't understand it then, but you understand it now. Come get baptized. Come and do it. We're ready for you. Who here loves Jesus? Come on. Guys, we love you so much. I'm going to invite Pastor Christian up as well. Pastor Christian, as you guys are doing this, we're going to keep this music playing. And we're going to keep you guys going. Remember, this is a moment between you and God. This is a beautiful atmosphere right now. When you are done here, Pastor Christian, anything you want to say? He's not here.